Francis Levy, our <laughs> co-director of the Philip Tatey Center. Ed Mishessian is the other co-director. And welcome to Shakespeare, the man behind the plays. Um, before we go on with the roundtable tonight, I want to call your attention to the art on the walls. Uh, it's our exhibit, The Body as Image. And a lot of time, people who come to Philip Tatey's don't really pay attention to the art because there's so many interesting people in the center of the room. But it's tied into our sex tet six-part series on sexuality, and tomorrow's uh, roundtable actually is the body and its image. So this is t it's totally appropriate to the roundtable tomorrow. Uh, but I wanted to also say that it's uh, Hallie Cohn, who is the curator of the show, along with Adam Ludwig helping her out. And they, the, the show really deals with the perverse and diverse forms of representation of bodily images. And... Um, there is an annex in the other room also where you can follow some of the exhibit there too. Uh, as Ed Nersessian cogently has pointed out in other roundtables, uh, we are continuing our multidisciplinary approach in this series on sexuality uh, by having uh, tomorrow a burlesque dancer, the following week a, an, an, a, a lap dancer, and uh, then we also have a, um, actually a dominatrix coming in from London. The, the, the lap dancer actually has a PhD from the University of Michigan, but the uh, dominatrix doesn't have any advanced degrees. <laughs> yes. Now, Edward Albee, Nicholson Baker, Judith Thurman, and Simon Winchester are all among the distinguished panelists who will be appearing at Philoctetes in the months ahead. So what you have to do is go to philoctetes.org. People are always concerned about, we have a lot of things happening this fall, a lot of roundtables. It's hard to keep up with them. It's hard, as you can see, for me to keep up with all this inf bilge of information. So what you have to do is go to philoctetes.org. It, it, it has a calendar, and it lists all the events. In addition, if you happen to miss any of our events, they are all available by going to archive, and you can, you can see them. And if you say are at home tonight and you would have liked to have seen this event, you simply go to philoctetes.org and it's simulcast. So people actually, there are people in Bulgaria. There's one. We have one. <laughs> we're able to follow this on Google. There's one Bulgarian who watch, we have a regular Bulgarian <laughs> attendee. Anyway, um, so I am now pleased to present Robert Brustein, who was actually a wonderful teacher of mine, I must say, and I'm always honored when he comes to visit us at Philoctetes. Um, uh, Robert Brustein is a distinguished scholar in residence at Suffolk University, senior research fellow and former professor of English at Harvard University, and past dean of the Yale Drama School. He was the founding director of the Yale Repertory Theater and the American Repertory Theater, where he continues to teach students. He has been theater critic for the New Republic since 1959, and is the author of 15 books on theater and society. His his most recent book, Millennial Stages, was published in 2006, and a new book, The Tainted Muse, Prejudice and Predispositions in Shakespeare's Life and Times, uh, will be appearing when? April of this next year. April of this next year, so keep your eyes out for that. In addition to 11 adaptations, including The Wild Duck, The Master Builder, and When We Dead Awaken, directed by Robert Wilson, he has written several full-length plays, including Demons, Nobody Dies on Friday, The Facelift, Spring Forward, Fall Back, and The English Channel, which I was very pleased to have had the opportunity to see. Uh, Mr. Brustein is the recipient of numerous awards, including the George Polk Award in Journalism, the 1995 American Academy of Arts and Letters Award for Distinguished Service to the Arts, and the George G. Nathan Award for Dram Dramatic Criticism. He has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and was recently inducted into the Theater Hall of Fame. Robert Brustein will moderate this evening's panel and introduce our other distinguished guests. Take it away, Bob. Thank you, Frank. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with my brilliant ex-student. Uh, I thank all of you for coming. Uh, I'm very honored to be a member of this very distinguished panel. Uh, and um, Philectetes or Philectetes, I've never known how to pronounce his name. Um, is very relevant to this because he was, uh, as you know, he was he's the hero of uh, Edmund Wilson's book, The Wound in the Bow, because he had a terrible separating wound that was so smelly that uh, he was exiled to an island, but he had a magic bow as well without which the Greeks couldn't win the Trojan War. So they held their noses and went to get his bow. Uh, he was, as it were, the first, um, uh, one of the earliest uh, uh, victims of bad health uh, care. Uh, and, uh, and he is, I think, marvelous person to preside over this. 
institution. Uh, now, let me introduce... Uh, what we're going to discuss today, by the way, is the whole question of Shakespeare's personality or Shakespeare's identity, if it's, you can possibly reach it uh, through the plays and through the poems. Uh, it's a very controversial subject. It'll never be resolved. Um, recently, there have been a number of books uh, starting, not starting, but um, predominantly uh, topped by Stephen Greenblatt's Will in the World that have really tried to draw a portrait of Shakespeare, who he was, what he thought. Uh, recently, the three books came out within months of each other. One was called Shakespeare the Thinker by A.D. Nuttall, was a posthumously uh, published. Another was called Thinking Shakespeare. And then there was one called Shakespeare Thinking. Uh, and so um, people are thinking of Shakespeare as a brainiac, in other words, that he had something on his mind that was available um, for all of us to reach and to develop some notion of whether he had a philosophy or attitudes towards a variety of subjects. Uh, it's interesting that A.D. Nuttall, who wrote the best of these books, uh, at the end of 555 pages said, ultimately, we can't figure out what Shakespeare thought. <laughs> so uh, you wonder uh, why he went to all that trouble. Anyway, <laughs> let, let me... Um, he didn't in know until the end. <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> let me introduce our, our panelists. Um, unfortunately, I don't have my glasses. Uh, would you do this? Because I... I um, Left my glasses at home. I'm trying to adopt the Brustinian. <laughs> How would you describe your, your, your presentation? My presentation? Yeah. Hammy. <laughs> Alvin, Epstein. Alvin Epstein appeared as Nag in the recent production of Endgame at VAM. He made his New York stage debut in 1955 with Marcel Marceau, then as the fool in Orson Welles' King Lear. He went on to play Lucky in the American premiere of Waiting for Godot with Bert Lahr and E.G. Marshall, repeating the role for TV with Zero Mostel in Burgess Meredith and Clove in the American premiere of Endgame. He's acted in over 150 productions on and off Broadway and in regional theaters. He's been associate director of the Yale Repertory Theater, artistic director of the Guthrie Theater, and founding member of the American Repertory Theater, we acted, where he acted for 25 years. He has appeared in many of Beckett's shorter pieces, including Ohio Prompt 2, What Where, Catastrophe, A. Joe, Ghost Sonata, Words and Music, Cascando, and others. He is the recipient of numerous awards for acting, including the OB Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, Eugene. Oh, yes. Uh, and you'll be joining us again for the Beckett on film. Right. Yes, yeah, so we're thrilled that that's with Albert Albert. Uh, Eugene Mahon. Is that the correct pronunciation? Mahon. It's Mahon. Mahon. Okay. Eugene Mahon is a training and supervising analyst at the Columbia Psychoanalytic Center for Training and Research. He practices child and adult psychoanalysis in Manhattan. He has published extensively in all the major psychoanalytic journals on a wide variety of topics. He is the author of several plays, including Yesterday's Sounds, A, Mouth, a Mouthful of Air, Anna, and Sigmund at the Rue Royale, and In the Company of Ghosts. He has published poetry and a psychoanalytic fable, Renzel and Redvick. One of his poems, Steeds of Darkness, was set to music by the American composer Miriam Gideon. Ron Rosenbaum, sitting right over there, is the author of seven books, most recently, The Shakespeare Wars and Explaining Hitler. His essays and journalism have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, the New York Times Book Review, Harper's, The Atlantic, and The New Yorker, among other periodicals. He writes a bi-weekly cultural column for the online magazine Slate, and has taught writing at Columbia, NYU, and the University of Chicago. And he had a wonderful column in The Observer, which I read for years, called The Edgy Enthusiast, and I was a member of the club. <laughs> get a card if you <coughs> wrote it in my, wrote in right away, and I'm a, a lifetime member, I'm proud to say. Daniela Varun is a theater director, acting teacher, and a longtime member of Shakespeare and Company in Lenox, Massachusetts. She has directed Shakespeare productions from coast to coast, as well as a broad variety of other plays in New York and regionally. She was associate director and co-founder with Christine Linklater and Carol Gilgan of the Company of Women, which produced all female productions of Shakespeare plays and created Shakespeare-based outreach programs for women and girls in the 1990s. With author Rona Silverbush, Ms. Varon is co-producer, director, and moderator of Conversations with Shakespeare, now in its third season at Symphony Space in New York and in development for public radio. 
He was a teaching artist and Shakespeare specialist for the Lincoln Center Theater, a founding faculty member of the Link Letter Center for Voice and Language, and a member of the theater department at Smith College. She is the director of the current New York premiere of Robert Houston's The English Channel at the Abington Theater Company, as well as the upcoming production of Jody Roth's Martha Mitchell Calling at the Nora Theater in Cambridge, Massachusetts. To my right, J.P. Waring is Professor Emeritus of English at the University of Arizona, where he taught <coughs> courses on Shakespeare and modern European drama. He is the author of 15 books, including The Shakespeare Diaries, a fictional autobiography, Bernard Shaw, and Nancy Astor, the 16 volume. As, and Nancy after. The 16th volume of the London State, 1890 to 1959. Critical editions are placed by Bernard Shaw and Arthur W. Pinero, and over 50 articles. He has held a Killam Post Doctoral Fellowship at the University of Alberta, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and a four year NEH major research grant. So there you have it. Thank you very, very much. Right, the question before us is whether um, Shakespeare has as much biography as the rest of us. Uh, whether, whether we can work up a curriculum vitae for Shakespeare, but more than that, whether we can reach into what he actually believed, whether there were any beliefs behind his plays. Uh, and um, how do you reach that conclusion? Um, well, one way is, of course, through his poems. Um, because you can theorize that he was much more subjective, much more personal, much more confessional, say in his sonnets, uh, than he was in his plays, which are essentially much more objective and uh, impersonal. Uh, and another criterion that I use is when something jumps out of a play, uh, like, for example, Hamlet's brutalization of Ophelia, which doesn't seem to fit into the uh, actual structure and conception of that play, and then you follow that misogyny that you find in that play, and you find it in any number of other plays, was Shakespeare a misogynist? Uh, in spite of the fact that he wrote some of the most extraordinary women characters, most genial, most what Shaw called the unwomanly woman, the first evidence of women who are not simply subordinate, but actually had strong personalities. Nevertheless, uh, there is enough kind of conflict, enough <laughs> anger, enough, especially towards faithless women, that starts in the sonnets and really finds its way, I think, as a thread throughout most of his plays until the very end when his plays become concerned more with fathers and daughters and reconciliation. Uh, so I'm going to throw this out to all of you, whether there aren't certain urgent things that push out, certain <laughs> things that through the nature of their frequency seem to obsess Shakespeare, and also things that he seems to share with his time, um, which makes him part of his time and not someone who is of all, just of all time, as uh, they say that Shakespeare was not of an age but for all time, but he was also of an age. And the question is, what did he share with his age? So I'm going to open this question up to the panelists and uh, ask for volunteers as to who would like to speak first <laughs> for that issue. I would like to uh, speak to the threshold question of whether more harm than good is done by seeking to understand Shakespeare's work through uh, the extremely sketchy, uh, conflicting uh, 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 factoids that we have about his biography. Um, consider, for instance, Homer. Aren't we better off knowing, or would we be better off knowing that Homer had an unhappy marriage, um, uh, or that he had a narcissistic mother? Um, uh, we know nothing about Homer, and yet, uh, uh, isn't it better than, uh, in a way, than trying to make up fables about him? Um, the fact that there are uh, often consistent uh, themes that leap out. I, I totally agree with that. But on the other hand, so many of them, the faithless woman, are conventions of poetry. Uh, and uh, for instance, the sonnets, uh, Stephen Booth, the uh, editor of the Yale edition of the sonnets, is famous for saying Shakespeare was certainly homosexual, heterosexual, or bisexual. The son <laughs> 
and the sonnets tell or us all three. and the sonnets say, tell us nothing about it um, because a poet adopts a persona and um, you know we we could twist the sonnets as many have done into uh, uh, four or five stories um, but uh, does that not take us away from the uh, uh, the pleasures of uh, diving into the uh, 14 line uh, universes that each poem represents without connecting them to a, uh, a man we can never know or a, uh, a situation that may not exist. Ron, what do you do, if I may ask you, what do you do um, about the fact that most of the love poems and the sonnets are written to a man? Um, and what do you do about the fact that when he actually discusses sex with that man, he says in effect that he can't make love to him because nature has pricked him out, as he says, with one thing to my purpose, nothing. So it seems very clear if you're to you know, accept what is being said in those sonnets that Shakespeare is attracted to other men but doesn't have the courage, as it were, or the commitment to be able to make love with them. I would say, one, that the poet of the sonnets is attracted to other men. No one could argue uh, about that. But that does not necessarily tell us anything about Shakespeare's love life. And uh, as to the impossibility of uh, them making love, homosexuals seem to have found a way over the years to do it. Um, and so um, I don't think that's a big obstacle. Um, <coughs> <laughs> it was an obstacle for Shakespeare. He couldn't bring a, 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 to, make, to to draw conclusions from the sonnets. He loved this man, but could not express that love sexually. Well, but why must we assume he is Shakespeare and, and not a persona created by a, a poet who uh, might have had a homosexual friend? Um, I think to treat the uh, the sonnets as personal diaries rather than um, great poems um, is in some way to diminish them. You don't think great poems have anything to do with the poet who wrote them? They some, sometimes do. Um, but, Almost invariably they do. Um, but, um, but you know that poets, uh, for instance, dramatic poets. Uh, is Shakespeare every character in his play? Uh, must uh, be well, we're talking about lyric now. We're yeah. not talking about drama. Okay, well, but I consider the sonnets in some way uh, Dramatic, uh, they could be se uh, seen as dramatic poems as well. Um, a poet adopts a persona, there's a lot of drama in there, and uh, perhaps he adopts that persona for dramatic purposes. But um, since there's so little reliable, um, I mean, yes, we can say they're about homosexual love, but um, what and, does it and, gain? And heterosexual. And heterosexual, of course. But what does that gain us? Um, if we uh, attempt to map it onto uh, a kind of uh, jerry-built notion of Shakespeare's life. Well, we've studied all other poets. We've studied Keats, we studied Joyce, we studied Strindberg, of course, who was the most subjective of dramatists and poets. We, we, we detect his life, we extract his life from his plays. Uh, Joyce, I think, is a very good example, because Joyce wrote that ma magnificent chapter about Shakespeare, in which he, uh, the library sequence, the Skiller and Charybdis sequence, uh, which I know you you discount, but uh, I think no, I love the best I things I've ever written that. about I, it was, but, but it was a beautiful work by Joyce, and, mm -hmm. and was not necessarily tell us anything about Shakespeare or. It tells us that Joyce functioned in the same way. But Joyce's work, you know, Stephen Dedalus, is an extension of James Joyce. Well, and, and, and quite often you'll find that in literature, that the work is the extension of the worker. So is our job to reason back from the poems to uh, construct a portrait of the, uh, the poet, or is it to read the poetry? Both. Mm -hmm. I, I feel life is short, art is long. Um, <laughs> one has a choice, um, I would rather spend it rereading King Lear 15 times than spending one afternoon worrying about uh, how homosexual the, uh, the person who wrote it was. No, but King Lear has nothing to do with homosexuality. King Lear has something to do with metaphysics. Well, I, I choose and, King Lear as an uh, example of Shakespeare's work that one could profit uh, more from reading and rereading than in uh, one could from biographical speculation. 
but you can speculate from that play about Shakespeare's, at least at that time when he wrote that play, about his concept of the universe, his concept of creation, his concept of creationism, his concept of nature. And we can do that without Shakespeare, without ma making up a Shakespeare. Can we not? Can we, can we not? Oh, we, we're not disallowed from doing that about Homer, are we? Sure. So, you know, why do we need to uh, uh, create a uh, fictive Shakespeare um, or reason backwards or um, when uh, Homer demonstrates that uh, you know, the poet's idea of the nature of the universe, human tragedy, human character, et cetera, et cetera, is what is more at issue than the actual um, personality of the poet. Can I break into this with an Please. actual piece of, uh, of known fact about Shakespeare, that he had twins? Yes. That one of them, Hamnet, died in 1596, mm -hmm. age 11. Mm -hmm. uh, and I took the mandate seriously that we were trying to say, what is the intersection between Shakespeare's life and Shakespeare's art? How does it affect his creative imagination? Now, this is not uh, the first time that the idea that, that, that the death of Hamlet in 1596 might have influenced the writing of the play Hamlet in 1599 or 1600. Um, it's not possible, of course, to follow the thread uh, with great clarity. but. I imagined that uh, by connecting uh, the death of the twin with the uh, writing of Hamlet, and then looking at the actual, uh, there are two uh, issues in Hamlet that are particularly, I think, connected to the concept of twinning. And they are the fact that there are some slips of the tongue in Hamlet. And there are also, as you probably know, there are 66 examples of the figure of, figure of speech Hendiades. And Hendiades, if you remember, is from the Greek hen, dia, dis, uh, one through two, that you capture the meaning, the essence of something using two words rather than, rather than one. So Shakespeare is full of this, sound and fury, uh, uh, the book and volume of my mind, uh, hearth and home. But the idea that there are 66 of these in, in Hamlet the only other play that comes close to it is Othello, I think, where there might be 30. But that he really began to use Hendiades in 1599, it seems to me suggestive, maybe, that the idea that, uh, that there could be a kind of a twinning wordplay that, that, that he became fascinated with uh, in, in 1599. And doesn't that connect in any way to the idea that a twin died four years prior to that? Um, this is highly speculative, um, obviously. But I would like to throw in one other point about the, <clears throat> the notion that in Shakespeare's plays, there are slips of the tongue. And there's, there's an intriguing slip of the tongue in the first uh, soliloquy. The ode that this too, too solid flesh would melt thaw and resolve itself into a Jew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh God, oh God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie on it, oh fie, tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely, that it should come to this but two months dead. Nay, not so much, not two. Now there Shakespeare, uh, Hamlet has slipped. He says that, he's, uh, that the uh, father died uh, two months ago, when it's actually one month. And here again, I think there is that notion of playing with two and one. Again, the hen deities, if you like. Uh, uh, what is the point? Uh, is Shakespeare perhaps using language of wordplay, twinning, in some way as an expression of uh, a terrible tragedy that occurred uh, when his son died, age 11? I have made my very speculative point, and I, and I will be silent. <laughs> <laughs> Responses. Very nice reading of it. <laughs> yes, Very I was nice. going to say, yes. Beautiful. Uh, I, I have an idea which just occurred to me, so I don't know if I can express it, but I'll try. Uh, I think that the, uh, the, the problem of whether Shakespeare is revealed through his plays or whether the plays mask him or show who he was is related to the question 
of whether Shakespeare really wrote the plays or not. Uh, I think it's an effort to establish that there really was such a person. If there was such a person, then there is the possibility that that person might have really written those plays that didn't have to be written by somebody else named Shakespeare. That th this was uh, an identifiable person who left traces through his work. Uh, <clears throat> and it, it may be a useless occupation or preoccupation, but it's like a compulsion that we have to, we have to find out we have to unravel the mystery. It's a mystery, and we have to do our best to find out what, what's the solution. Was there really this man and his plays and his sonnets should prove it to us? And if there was, did he really write those plays and sonnets? So I, I think they're related somehow. It's a sort of a human compulsion that we have in order to solve this mystery. There's no question he wrote the plays. Uh, and the best proof, the best proof is that Ben Jonson said he did. And Ben Jonson is the most envious playwright who ever lived. And if Shakespeare had not written those plays, he would have been the first to say so. Um, it's just people in the 20th century and the 21st century who think that you can't write unless you have a PhD. You've gone to Harvard or you've gone to Yale and you've got a foolish piece of fool's cap, as we say in the play, um, who believe that Shakespeare can't, you know, couldn't, couldn't write great plays unless he had this advanced education. Freud was one of those. Freud was one of those, you're quite right. Could I just, he was an Oxfordian. Could I throw just another wrinkle into the mix? Uh, the other day, in thinking about the, the discussion, um, I was reminded that and it's a point that Bob takes up in his play, that all but about four of his plays are not Shakespeare's plots. He is a great adapter. Mm -hmm. And you see him starting off his career uh, with the histories and so on and so forth. Uh, even the great tragedies, uh, stolen. Uh, very, very little of it, as it were, comes out of nowhere, which makes me think that he must have been a very practical kind of playwright, as all playwrights and directors and actors must be. If I'm going to take on this trade, how do I make it work in the theater? Uh, and a very ready way, certainly in his own time, of getting going was to adapt history plays. They were very popular. Uh, you don't need a plot. It's ready made. Um, so far as social background is concerned, it certainly uh, provides ramifications for the monarchy and the authorities and all that kind of thing, divine right of kings and so on and so forth. Um, so it seems to me that the man who wrote all that kind of stuff and turning them out at the rate of two, sometimes three, three a year, was a very practical chap. Uh, who happened to have a great facility at writing iambic pentameter. <coughs> Uh, I knew an actor up in um, uh, the University of Alberta, Bill Mylan, who died just a few years ago. And at any party that you were at, would sashay around the room uh, composing limericks on you, just at the drop of a hat, knowing just one thing about you. Well, it was Mylan's facility. Iambic pentameter happened to be uh, Shakespeare's. And when he writes prose, it's very straightforward, very ordinary kind of prose. Uh, and, of course, we shouldn't forget at the same time, if it was indeed the Shakespeare that we think it was, he was also, for a good part of his career, an actor. Uh, and since we don't have a great many uh, stage directions in his plays, uh, it seems to me that it would be pretty clear <coughs> that he was there on the job, helping the other actors out, discussing parts, even as he was writing them. Again, something that Bob takes up in his play. Um, and all this kind of stuff takes a great deal of time and effort and practicality. I keep on going back to practicality because it seems to me that's what the plays demonstrate 
in terms of dramatic craft uh, throughout all his career, even to the point, and then I'm going to shut up, the last three, and perhaps we can come back to this later because it's a different aspect of the theatre and creativity. When you get to The Winter's Tale, Cymbeline, and The Tempest, Shakespeare goes back to what I think haunts all members of the theatre trade, which is the nature of the art. And just because it is so much fiction, so much illusion, and he writes three different kinds of play, three plays which explore three different kinds of theatrical illusion. Uh, the time gap, for instance, in the middle of Winter's Tale, the unities of The Tempest, and Cymbeline, which happens to be one of my favorite plays, which is just a gallimaufry of, of plot and of self-reference self and all those kinds of things. So there was my 10 cents worth. Thank you, JP. Well, can I jump in? Because you Please, said iambic Daniela. pentameter. <laughs> and um, you know, Shakespeare wasn't just really good at iambic pentameter. He blew up iambic pentameter. Marlowe was good at iambic pentameter and wrote plays that have thousands and thousands of lines of unvaried iambic pentameter, which is the most organic rhythm of, of yes. spoken English. We, yes. Most of us speak an iambic pentameter much of the time and don't notice. We speak about 10 syllables and take a breath. You know, um, and the stress is that it's the it's the rhythm of the human heart, and I would do it, but this microphone would explode. But it's you know, ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum ba bum. You know, if we're, if our hearts were going bum 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 bum, we should go to cardiologists. You know, right away. But it's the rhythm of the it's the rhythm of the heart. But what Shakespeare Atrial does is he takes the iambic pentameter that Marlowe sort of introduced as a as a as a form of verse mm -hmm. for the English mm -hmm. drama, and he starts doing brilliant things to it that really reflect the emotional changes in the characters and what's happening to them. And the rhythm starts shifting and changing and becoming unambic. And this is, you know, this isn't just sort of crafty playwriting. I mean, this is a kind of, of well, it's a kind of genius to sort of have somebody like Leontes, who's in The Winter's Tale, who thinks his wife has been unfaithful to him, who's extremely upset. And he, and he doesn't, you know, he says, too hot, too hot to mingle friendship far as mingling bloods. I have tremor cordis on me. My heart dances, but not for joy, not joy. That's not iambic pentameter. That's, that's, that is, that is fibrillation. That's cardiac arrhythmia. And he not only speaks that way, but he diagnoses it as he's speaking it. So you have, you have a playwright who is, you know, has an understanding of the organic rhythms of, of, the, of the human body and of the human psyche that's far in advance of his time. You know, and, and so, you know, just what I come around to is, for me, what's remarkable is that anybody wrote these plays, you know? And whether, whether it's a genius like Shakespeare who had a grammar school education, which was actually quite a good education, or whether it's a more aristocratic genius with a higher level of education, it's just a tiny difference in degree to me because it's it's an inexplicable level of genius. So I actually am with Bob because I like to think that genius comes from, you know, from can come from humbler sources and that it's inexplicable. And I, you know, I consider myself at this table the leading expert on Bob Brewstein's opinions about Shakespeare, <laughs> having worked with him recently. And, um, you know, and I, I've actually heard him posit the theory that Shakespeare was an alien, which seems, you know, said it jokingly. But, but so, to me, it doesn't matter, you know, if it was Edward de Vere, the aristocrat, or the, you know, the Glover's son from Stratford, which I'd like to think it was. Whoever it was, was way ahead of his, you know, of his circumstances, of his time, and, you know, maybe we can talk about that later, but had a considerably different understanding of psychology than most of his peers did, and of what makes the psyche work. It was, it was the nature of the language, the way that you're describing it, that allowed people like Charles Lamb to distinguish the, the, the more stiff line of, of Fletcher from this fibrillation, as you call it so beautifully, line of Shakespeare. The only like thing I was going to add, though, to your point, which, which is a very good story. one, is that he was writing for a very fixed company, which is one of the remarkable features of uh, the King's, King's Men, Lord Chamberlain, sure. whatever, yeah. whatever you want to call it, depending on Part of, and you can see it uh, certainly in the recurrence of typical roles, stereotypical roles. And you can also see it in how female roles 
either expand or contract, depending, only on my theory, that at a given time you had a better boy actor, say for Cleopatra, than uh, say for Miranda. And so you write for your company. Right. Uh, and so some of the things where he starts fibrillating may very well be because uh, he knows that Burbage or whoever can carry that role, or Burbage turns around. Again, one of Bob's points, you know, the autolycus mode of picking up the trifle, Burbage said something uh, along those lines, or why don't we try that? And away Shakespeare goes and starts scribbling away. But, you know, there's no evidence for that, I'd like to, except uh, the plays. I'd like to take up the uh, alien theory. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't actually say that Shakespeare. No, 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 no. no, I, 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 did, no I, I, I did a production in which the three witches were aliens. No, 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 <laughs> no I, 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 I totally understand the metaphoric impl implications and not the literal uh, ET implications of this. Um, because, uh, because I think it is the really interesting question about Shakespeare, the person. Um, uh, the exceptionalist question. Uh, was he on the continuum of other great writers, just on the far, far end, very, 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 very great? Or did he represent something alien, something uh, beyond what had been seen before or, or had been seen after? I mean, remember uh, Peter Brook, the uh, Shakespearean, British Shakespearean director, saying to me, I, 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 I don't understand it. Uh, you know, most of us walk around 1% alive. Um, here was this person walking around London who was a million percent alive. And what does that mean? I mean, I, I'd be interested in whether other, what, what other people think about the exceptionalist question. Is, uh, is Shakespeare in some different category from other writers? Well, depending on how many writers you've known, they're not 100% alive. They're 100% alive when they're writing um, and when they're dreaming. But um, a lot of them goes into the work, and it leaves them drained as human beings. Um, so I don't know if he was 100% alive. I, I, the question is, you know, if you think of Shakespeare, was he a vi vivid, vital, dynamic individual that everyone wanted to be friends with? And we do know that everyone loved him. Um, or did he put most of his energies into his work? Would you put him at the center of the canon as, as Harold Bloom does, and that every other writer, subsequent writer, is measuring against the quality of his writing? Well, he's the greatest writer that ever lived. I think we can say that. Um, it's hard to choose the greatest composer who ever lived. I mean, there are a number that you know compete, Mozart and Schubert, Beethoven, what have you. Bach. Bach, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, but, but Shakespeare does pretty much, I think, stand, stand alone, um, followed, you know, hard upon by a number of very brilliant writers. Uh, but if we can get back to the, what Shakespeare believed, because um, I think we can begin to determine certain things that he did believe, or certain prejudices that he had, if I can, you know, go back to my book. One of them was about effeminacy. I'm not talking about homosexuality, I'm talking about a feminist thing. Um, the Osrics, the Oswalds, the, uh, the character on the battlefield at Hotspur uh, is so contemptuous of the Lord, you know, who, who was taking um, a poncet box to his nose when uh, the, the corpses were smelling too much. As compared with his idea of masculinity, which is the Kents and the Eno Barbuses, you know, the plain dealers who are honest, blunt, and what have you, and his notion that um, one should uh, expend one's blood on the battlefield rather than in the bedroom. You know the notion of the time, the humorous theory that semen was dried blood. And if you didn't expend your blood in some way, it would dry up and you'd have to make love. <laughs> so the courtier was the very opposite of the, of the soldier in that regard. And um, the courtier was not um, homoerotic so much as he was heterosexual, but excessively heterosexual uh, with the court ladies. And um, I think you can see from play to play that remains a consistent idea in Shakespeare. Is it a prejudice? Uh, I don't know, but it's an idea that doesn't seem to vary. And so I think you can detect certain things like that that, um, that don't change from play to play and appear often enough. 
Would you agree with Tony Nuttall at all that uh, from play to play he's constantly uh, thinking out the, the, the piece that, that, that he left over from the previous play? So that, if he, so that if he writes about yeah. mercy in uh, mm -hmm. The Merchant of Venice, mm -hmm. in Measure for Measure he's writing about justice. Mm -hmm. that, that, and, he, and he's trying to figure out the, the, the complicated uh, interdigitation between too much mercy or too much justice. Mm -hmm. But the idea that there's a developmental thread running through the thinking, which would be the opposite, I think, somewhat, of your saying that uh, he's stuck with this effeminacy idea. And no, brings. I think certain things changed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, those ideas didn't change, but his attitude towards, towards the universe changed. His idea towards the creation of the world changed. His idea towards whether there is a transcendent God in the universe, I think that changed. In the late place. In, the, in, yeah. in Lear, certainly. Yeah. And from Lear on, you think I mean, in, in Lear there is a transcendent God, or no, there isn't. Yet, so. I think to his horror, he yeah. he agrees with with Edmund that nature is all there is, and if nature is all there is, then conscience of vaunt. It's a word that cowards use. And then where does the redemption in the later plays come from? Uh, a, a conversion or some sort? Or? The redemption comes from personal relationships. I mean, between you know fathers and, and daughters. You uh, point that out in your book. Um, and that seems to, you know, he becomes a father who's left with two daughters. He has lots of trouble with those girls. Um, one of them develops gonorrhea, right? It was Judith, I think. There was some scandal. In some scandal, yeah. <laughs> Susanna makes a bad marriage. Um, anyway, he, but nevertheless, that's where his feelings seem to go uh, after the death of his son. They go to his, his daughters. And that you find in the plays. I mean, those four or five plays that have to do with Prospero and Miranda and Pericles and uh, Perdita. Is it Perdita? Marina. 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 And um, Leontes and Perdita. And Leontes and Perdita, exactly. And Lear. And Lear and Coy. It starts with Lear and And Cybele yeah. and Imogen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But until then, I mean, until those late plays, he, in terms of what does he believe, he see, whoever wrote these plays seems to very much believe in the hierarchical view of the world that the, the Elizabethans had, the great chain of being, where mm -hmm. everybody has a place that's determined by God, and you belong in a particular place. And if you try to step out of that place, it's ambition, it's pride, it's 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 things that lead to a fall. And this was, I mean, th this was the Elizabethan world picture, world view that he was born into. It comes from the Middle Ages. And then he's constantly showing characters who are fighting against that world view or who, who get, and they always get in trouble. I mean, so it's not that he's a great Democrat. You know, I mean, he does show these characters everything from obviously that fun Scottish couple, you know, who decide they want to be a little higher in the chain of being and get into a lot of trouble. And I mean, that's, you know, so we're looking at regicide, which is, you know, a very high sort of misstep in the chain of being, to, um, to Helena in All's Well That Ends Well, who's a commoner who falls in love with, with, um, with a nobleman and uh, finds a way to marry him but gets into a lot of trouble as a result. So he shows us the tension of the time that's, that's fighting against this, this worldview that comes from the Middle Ages, where you like, belong in a particular place and aren't ever to move. And then he shows us sort of the, the desire for upward mobility that's becoming big in the Renaissance as, as, um, as people begin to sort of, these voyages of discovery and merchant, I mean, people begin to be able to step out of their narrow little world and advance in the world by making money as opposed to according to where they were born. So I think we see, you know, we see that he's very much of his time. He shows the struggle against it. Uh, he shows that people get punished for struggling against that. Um, and he's always talking about heaven and hell in all of his plays. These are real places to whoever wrote these plays. They're real. Not and he, he may, yeah, but by, well, and then he shifts. Mm -hmm. You know, he shifts his worldview over this long writing career. Um, but the lost daughter Imogen is of a different order, surely, than the others, given the style of Cymbeline, or at least my own reading of it, since it seems to me, and I've yet to see a production that actually does this, I'm afraid, uh, it's a burlesque. It's a fairy tale. It's, um, it starts off with you know, the Wicked Queen, uh, and you've got Rotten Clotten, uh, and Imogen 
waking up next to his headless corpse is not a serious moment, it should bring the house down. And so her being a lost daughter is not of the same order as Cordelia or something like that, it seems to me. So it's not all of a piece. Well, Jonathan Miller did a King Lear in which the three daughters were Cinderella and her two evil stepsisters. <laughs> so, <laughs> Revived in Cindy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The redemption that's mentioned in uh, The Two Noble Kinsmen, the, the final play according to Harold Bloom, um, where at the very end of the play uh, the lines go something like, uh, there's a mockery of the heavenly charmers, what sport you make of us. But the characters are, are told to, to go off and bear us like the time, as if, as if the redemption would come from uh, the recognition that we are time, uh, time bound. We are human, mm -hmm. uh, forked animals, uh, as, as he puts it in Lear. Uh, and that the, the redemption is in being human. Mm -hmm. The redemption, as you put it, is, is, is in relationships. Mm -hmm. Alvin, from the actor's point of view, is that true? That redemption is in relationships? I don't know. <laughs> Alvin recently played both Lear and Prospero, his second cousin. Yeah, but you know, I'm I'm an actor, and I think um, that one of my acting techniques is to forget everything that I have just done and go on to the next one. Um, which means I, I have very deep feelings about everything that's been said here, but uh, I can't make uh, conclusions, can't come to conclusions. I know that, uh, well, when we're talking about iambic pentameter, uh, to me there isn't any Shakespeare without it. I mean, and uh, it, it's, the, it, it, it's the groundwork, it's really the basis of the whole thing. Uh, but then, as I've worked on text and, and, and studying and learning them through the iambic pentameter, uh, I, I little by little realize, and this is what uh, is so absolutely extraordinary with Shakespeare that I really don't think is anywhere else in the world, I don't, not that I know of, and I've acted lots of other plays, that it suddenly seems like the, the, the surface that's created by the iambic pentameter becomes transparent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are deep things underneath that rise to the surface, and you don't know where they're coming from. And that's, uh, I, I have found that in just about everything of Shakespeare that I've ever acted, and I've done quite a lot of them. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm, I'm not able to uh, make a theory out of it. <laughs> well, lots of other people have. But I, I mean, I, just, I agree. I mean, the, the language is, is the extraordinary. I mean, we can talk around it, but, you know, working as an actor, as a director, it's we listen to him. We have to listen to him. He's talking to us, you know, through through the language, not just the the rhythm, not just the pentameter, but the you know the images, the metaphors, the figures of speech, the antitheses, all the things that he does so brilliantly in the language are his clues about what these characters feel, not just what they think but and what they say. But that's a miracle. And it's of a it. mir it's a miracle. Yeah. And when you start decoding that language, as John Barton is, you know, one of the most brilliant people who <coughs> have done that, you find that you know he. He, he wrote in a time when Shakespeare was an actor writing in a time when there were no directors. There was no director who was going to say, Alvin, do you think maybe, you know, he might be a little sad here? Do you know, I mean, I, you know, my job was, didn't exist. The, the information is, is in the language. It's in the text. And the actor, this company of actors who work together in true repertory, you know, a fading thing in our culture, you know, could pick up the, these texts, these sides, and because of the structure of the language, know what they were meant to feel and 
where they breathed and where they paused and where they got more emotionally plugged in and you know and found that incredible transparency don't you think I mean yeah I mean things well up there's such uh, a, an abundance of real humanity buried in there yeah. uh, and it uh, you can bring it to the surface if yeah. you if you let it. Yeah. And I have to say, I mean, I, you know, I, I saw your Lear, and when Alvin was out in the heath, you know, in a loincloth, I mean, it wasn't that he was playing at being a child. He became a child. Lear became a child. And, it, and the language gave you that, you know? Yeah, I, yeah, mean, yeah. I mean, you picked it up. You know, it was genius. But it, it was, you know, again, it wasn't Lear playing at anything. It's that he became that in that moment. Speaking of uh, language, um, uh, I don't mean to be such an absolutist, uh, anti-biographical person. I'm interested in what kind of writer Shakespeare is, because I think it has makes a crucial difference in a way uh, how we interpret the two different endings of Lear, the two different endings of Hamlet. And the, the, practically the first third of my book is about whether Shakespeare was a reviser, whether he was the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, wastrel of Shakespeare in love who dashed off play, sent him to the playhouse, felt a wenching again, or was he a serious literary artist who actually revised his work? And this is like, for the past quarter century, the scholarly world has been divided about this. I'd be interested what other people, what kind of writer um, people think he is. Because if he, if he did revise, then he gave Lear a more redemptive ending. Um, and he added four O's to the end of Hamlet. Um, and what do we do with them? And what does that mean? Or on the other hand, if it wasn't him, if it was some playhouse hand, uh, it's something else. So that's a question that interests me. The relationship between the writer and the actor in this period, as you suggested, is uh, you, it's adhesive. I mean, you cannot pull them apart. And Shakespeare was clearly writing for the actors. I mean, when you point out that Olivier, in your book, Olivier played this part at 40 years old, um, and therefore lost out on a, 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 approached it from a completely different point of view. But on the other hand, uh, Burbage must have been close to 40. I don't know how old he was, but when he played the part, um, and Shakespeare can't decide whether he just, you know, got out of college or he's, yeah. or or he's fat and scant of breath, which um, Burbage probably was at this point uh, because he was aging. So what happens is you get the actor, Talton, you get um, uh, Kemp and um, what's the name of the other, the clown that took the place of Kemp? Armin. Pardon me? Armin. Yes, Robert Armin. Robert Armin. Yeah. Uh, Robert Armin. And uh, the, the parts are written for them and um, interlaced with their personalities. So he probably, if he makes any changes, he makes them for them, rather than for himself. But then we have, you know, Johnson's remark that people say that he never blotted a line. And so what? What that he had blotted a thousand? Said <laughs> Johnson, but he never blotted a line. Um, so it doesn't sound like he's doing much revising. Hi, John Thompson over there. How are you? <laughs> so what do you think? Did he? That's our Othello. Blot a line, or? Hmm? Did he blot a line, or did he, uh, or not? We have we have the uh, hand D, his edition, supposed handwritten edition mm -hmm. to uh, the play of Sir mm -hmm. Thomas More, which mm -hmm. has lots of ink blots and cross outs. Mm -hmm. Although it's not been completely authenticated, um, he must have blotted a line. Um, lots of lines. But but, <laughs> but but I'm, you know, I think the folio probably was 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 cut for uh, for an acting edition and. Uh, I don't think Shakespeare's full play, full plays were published in the folio. Uh, oh, you know, if he'd been alive, he would have complained like crazy. But don't you think it's a myth that uh, about, about the not blotting of the lines? It's a bit like the the Mozart myth that Mozart's music just yeah, flows. Yes, right. Yes, yes. Myth when, of genius, we know yeah. that he, uh, yes. we know that Mozart revised sure. and, and worked on his music. Yeah. And he did add at the end of Lear that amazing passage: "Look her lips, look there, yes, look there." Yes, I mean, yes. you know. Um, uh, that wasn't in the Cordo version, and uh, uh, the Cordo version offers no uh, uh, escape from the bleakness of the universe and uh, 
did he then feel that people were watching this play and going home and slitting their wrists and uh, he needed to add something redemptive or? But you look at any playwright and you'll find six different versions of anything she writes or he writes. Um, you know, grab the computer and you'll see this version, this version, this version, this <coughs> version. I mean, Daniela got a completely different version of my play than we ended up with because she forced me to revise it um, in certain areas. I had not been faithful to iambic pentamen, and she made me be faithful, and she improved the play enormously as a result of that insistence. But, you know, I have a lot of versions of, of that play. Um, the last line of Bernard Shaw's Arms and the Man, right from the very first production, has never remained stable. Is that what? Never remained stable. Mm -hmm. And there's brand new evidence <laughs> that on the very first production it wasn't even spoken. Mm -hmm. Crossed out in rehearsal by the stage manager. Mm -hmm. And that was a line that he kept toying with and toying with uh, mm -hmm. until 1930. So it's, it's not uncommon. I mean, uh, and, and who knows who authorized the quarto, uh, you know, how did it get to the press and so on and so forth. Um, but and other things that he just simply, I mean, when you talk about blotting lines, if you think of, say, you mentioned Anabarbus earlier on, I mean, he just, he takes slabs out of Hollandshed for Anabarbus to speak or yes. Romeo and Juliet mm -hmm. that are bits out of, straight out of Brook. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not Shakespeare, it's... It's the other guys. But isn't it amazing, by the time you get to John Milton, everything is written down uh, very carefully. Uh, there's no ambiguity about what Milton put down on the page. At least I don't think there's as much as, as, as there is about Shakespeare. He's not a dramatist, that's what. But, but th it's a good question, I think, about Shakespeare. Why was he so casual with these extraordinary acts of genius? Because he really he seemed to think that Lyric poetry was more important than dramatic poetry. The plays didn't belong to him. <laughs> Those are the only things he was it's, interested it's in amazing. publishing. It's an amazing no, issue. No, the plays belong to the company. Yes, not, but not, still. Not the man. You'd imagine a little bit of narcissism would spill over and that he would want well, to. Well, that's how they did business. Uh, you know, <coughs> until, until they, you know, and they didn't want them published because somebody else could get hold of them and perform them because people needed plays to perform. So it was just a different business arrangement. I don't see any particular difficulty about all that. Um, and it, we know enough about, about that to, to say it was so. And in fact, we were lucky that the folio was published and, and the stuff was saved, you know, because several, what, is it seven or 11, hadn't appeared prior to the folio. I forget the number anyway. But it's interesting that there's only one version of the sonnets, there's only one version of Venus and Adonis, there's only one version of the Rape of Lucrece. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yet all the other plays always have manifold versions. And I think it has to do with just the fact that these are revisions and stage managers, actors, stage managers, copies, actors, actors, audience members. And we haven't <laughs> talked about how many lines Shakespeare catch from his actors. Mm -hmm. Not only from Marlowe, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I'm sure the actors contributed a lot of stuff oh, sure. that Shakespeare sure. never thought of. But speak no more set down for you. Huh? <laughs> 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 right. Because he knew that that was happening, and yes, he yes. was smart enough to take the good ones. Yes. <laughs> but Hemings and Condell, who were his company members who edited and put together the first folio after his death, in their introduction to it, speak of the ease with which he wrote. And they, they definitely sort of give this picture of somebody who wrote with great ease and fluidity and was not a sort of slogging away revising. I mean, but again, who knows, you know, who knows what. Right. But two plays a year, I mean, you've got to write with ease. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, what you were talking about, I mean, this idea that one of the ways in which he revised was by revisiting his plots and his late plays in the romances. If you, you know, if you look at the romances, they go back to, you know, um, to earlier plays. And Winter's Tale has all the elements of Othello, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you, you can find pieces of different plays all coming back to life in the romances, but then with sort of different, with different endings to the story, you know, still with suffering, but not, not such rampant tragedy as, as in the earlier versions. It's a different kind of revision. You know, it's actually a revision 
of those of those plots that he took from others earlier in his career. The ending of Pericles is, in a way, a, a rewriting of the ending of Lear. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Should we open this to the audience for questions, or unless um, there's something urgent that any of you would like to add before we? If anyone has a question they would like to, please come to the microphone, identify who you are, and uh, and then pose your question. Like say yes. I have a question. Uh, the title of the round table, if I read it correctly, is The Man Behind the Place. Uh, the assumption being, I assume, that knowing the man behind the place is of a certain degree of importance or relevance. If that is the assumption, what is the relevance? What, why does it matter? Why does it matter to know the man behind the place? Yes. Um, well, it's a more, it's a romantic notion, actually. It belongs to romanticism, and I think, you know, we're on the threshold of romanticism with the Elizabethan age. I mean, not quite there, but we have to go through the 17th century, 18th century. We're eventually going to get to romanticism. Uh, and um, romanticism, as we know, is a very subjective form of literature. And um, uh, it is hard to distinguish or separate the person who writes the work from the work itself uh, from the 19th century on. Uh, even T.S. Eliot, you know, who considers himself a classicist and personal artist and praises impersonal artists like Middleton. See, Middleton, we don't know anything about Middleton. I would say, you know, I can't find a person in Middleton's plays. Uh, they're great plays, but where is he? <laughs> um, and I don't think that's true of Shakespeare. Uh, just that it's, it's not true of Joyce. Um, um, you know, that uh, everything he writes, almost including Finnegan's Wake, but certainly Portrait of the Artist, Stephen Hero, and Ulysses, are extensions of the artist. They are reflections of the artist, uh, not, in his case, very close to his own life, somewhat fictionalized. Uh, so I think knowing about the person can help us know about the work, and knowing about the work can help us know about the person. I don't you know, I think Ron is right that, you know, you can consider the work as purely autonomous uh, and just put it on. Uh, and that's what, you know, theater companies do. They don't care who Shakespeare was. They put on Shakespeare. Uh, and then there are scholars like Stephen Greenblatt and new historicists who want to know who the man was and feel that they would understand the plays better if they did know the man. <laughs> So I think we can embrace both approaches, the classical and the romantic. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that T.S. Eliot rejects as an artistic failure Hamlet because he says it lacks an objective correlative. What he's saying is it's too subjective. It's too personal, um, which is what makes it great, what makes it imaginative, what makes it a very special play, that it escapes everybody's attempt to analyze it and subsume it. Uh, so, but the classicists, and I think Ron, you're probably a classicist at heart, would say that the, you know, let's look at it from a purely impersonal point of view and just deal with the work and forget about the human being that created it. I would say that um, uh, I, 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 I'm more there's as, as much a, a new historicist in me in the sense that I believe that uh, you can't deal with the work in the vacuum. It, it's part of the fabric of the society that, uh, that produced it. And so uh, the study of uh, the other works and other uses of language, et cetera, et cetera, is, um, is important. Um, you know, and I'm not sure how I'd feel if uh, someone were to uh, come forth with a uh, complete biography of Shakespeare, um, I'd certainly read it. But uh, I mean, but we just don't have it really, and so that's why I feel the, the study of the man can do more harm than good. But the study of the society and the um, uh, its attitudes and um, the playwright's relation to those are uh, important. We're talking, though, about a spiritual and an intellectual biography rather than an actual biography. Um, I mean, whether he became a money lender in the last years of his life, that doesn't tell us anything about the plays. But whether he was um, 
whether you know he fell in love with a dark lady who betrayed him with a fair youth, I think that does tell us something about the plays, and it tells us something about the sonnets. Um, so, you know, it's, it's aspects of the biography that uh, I find important. I think there's another, there's another point, I think, going back to something Ron once wrote about it in one of your essays. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. You had done uh, something on Hitler, actually, and you were talking about evil that doesn't fall on the kind of, on the, on the spans of, of, of normal human behavior, like an evil so great. And, 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 I, and about Shakespeare, I wonder if there isn't a genius so great that, you, you know, there's a, there's a psychoanalytic tome called, I think it's a Talent and Genius, isn't it, Ed, by K.R. Eisler? I mean, you have talent and then you have genius. And, and I think one of the things that maybe Ed is alluding to, why prosecute this whole notion of the, of the, of the, of the Shakespeare? Because, like you said, he's the greatest, the greatest writer of all time. And with, now we go on to a level, maybe, of something that exceeds the normal capacity of most human beings. And, and that is an interesting area to prosecute in and of itself, an interesting area to, sort of, to, to think about, maybe. What, what, is the, what is the difference between having mere talent, like maybe a Middleton does, or a Fletcher, and then going further and taking it to some, to have this, what, is, what are the constituents of this type of character? That might make, you know, rather than, okay, so like you say, literally what happened is quotidian. But really, really understanding that becomes really one of the great quests of, of, uh, of uh, modern you know, aestheticism in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah, I agree that uh, I, I mean, the, it's, it, with Hitler's studies, uh, it's the exceptionalist question is he on the continuum of other evildoers, very, very, very bad man, or uh, uh, does he occupy uh, uh, some uh, realm of radical evil? And this is their equivalent in literary uh, talent, of radical talent um, or beyond great writers. And I don't know. Um, you know, um, I, I instinctively think so because I haven't had the kind of experiences that uh, I've had with uh, other writers that I have with Shakespeare. Here's a thought just occurred to me. Um, why is it that so many Shakespearean villains are actors? Um, <laughs> I mean, like Iago. Iago is an actor. And the part he's playing is the part of a plain dealer. You know, that conventional character that Shakespeare has all through his plays. He plays the part that he seems. And, you know, Hamlet is going on about, I know not seems. He doesn't dissimulate. He doesn't pretend. But actually, he does. And when he does, uh, that's when he begins to go over into maybe the area of villainy. Uh, when he gets more complicated, he's no longer the hero of that play, but he's the hero villain of that play. Um, he doesn't, this is a man who writes for actors, who believes in the theater, and yet the person who acts, who seems, who dissimulates, who pretends, is usually the villain in his plays. But there's a matter of theatricality mm -hmm. throughout virtually all the canon. I mean, let's say starting with Myths of a Night's Dream. Yes. His concept, which goes back to my earlier comment about the last three, about his playing around with the how to write plays, he constantly, not just with villains, but he constantly reminds his own audience mm -hmm. that this is indeed a fiction. Constantly. I mean, it's, it, mm -hmm. it, it just leaps out at you, and seemings uh, is or, one of them. And, and or so it's on. a dream. Or it's a dream, or yes. And yeah. dreaming and acting somehow get combined, especially in The Tempest, your final speech, when those phrases, dreaming and acting. Uh, I told you I forget everything I like. <laughs> 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 Our actors have faded into air, into thin air. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, Iraq, you will I, probably know we have such speech. stuff as we have such stuff as dreams of me. But there are also yeah. lines where, yeah. uh, if you and Pyramus and Thisbe, where, when you mentioned dream, it, it suddenly popped into my mind. Pyramus, Pyramus and Thisbe is a very good example of there's a tragedy that is acted comedically, and take those lines from the tragedy and put it in a comedy. They can be the, exactly the same lines. But here it's comedic, here it's tragic. It's Romeo and Juliet. It's exactly, Romeo and exactly Juliet. so, yeah. And it's interesting, Romeo and Juliet, she says, thus with a kiss I die. And in As You Like It, Rosalind says, men have died from time to time and worms have eaten them, but not for love. <laughs> this is the same man who wrote that. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, here we are, you know, we're still talking about him, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. it's 400 years later, mm -hmm. almost 400 years since his death. So in a way, that's, that's an answer to, was he exceptional or, you know, mm -hmm. where does he fall? But it feels to me like we're, we're in a constant dialogue with Shakespeare in our culture. I mean, we're, you know, we're talking about him, but we're talking to him and he's talking to us. And, you know, I, I mean, I completely agree with Ron. We have to look at him in the context of his times. You know, if you look at a play like The Taming of the Shrew, which you know is a very controversial play. And if you look at it from a 21st century point of view, it's a play about an abused wife with Stockholm syndrome. You know, I mean, that's, but that's if we look at it just from now. You know, if you look at it in the context of when it was written, he, it's not a play written by a misogynist. It's a play written by a man who has an extraordinarily humane vision of how to tame a shrew compared with the shrew legends that abounded at the time, where women who spoke up were considered scolds or nags, were treated with unbelievable physical brutality. And that's what the people of his time were familiar with. So he writes a play in which someone tames a shrew with kindness and by, by training her like you train a, fa a falcon, you know, which is a radical idea at the time. And, and you know, a, a, a man who actually helps a woman become someone who can function in her society when she can't, you know. I mean, if you look at it within the context of its time, it's a radically different play. So, you know, we have to look at it in the context of its time, but we can only play it in ours, you know, and we live in a post Freudian world. And so, you know, it's his words, but it's, you know, it's our actors. I mean, it's, it's what, you know, it's who you are, it's what you know, you know, and you know something different living in the 21st century than you would have, you know, in the 17th century. So we're, we're always in dialogue back and forth with this man, regardless of, of who he was or, or whether we know who he was. Well, speaking of that, we have, I don't want to put you on the spot, but we have one of my friends is here tonight who's writing a novel about Shakespeare. Andrea, did you want, did you want to say, what, say anything about why you're impelled to write a novel? You're speaking about a dialogue with Shakespeare. If, would you like to say anything to the panel about that or to the audience about that? Come to the microphone for a second. Just maybe you can share with us or come to your... Um, Oh gosh, so put on the spot. But um, I guess it's just that same inclination to wonder what someone was and what their background and what their uh, impulses and motivations to uh, to to do what they did. I mean, I, I'm I'm taking a sort of point of view of someone who the main character is not Shakespeare, so it's someone who um, got him sort of to where he was when he really launched on the on the London stage and and his book doctor let's put it that way um, <laughs> someone who, his his writing coach or something as you would you might but someone who uh, who in a sense opened his eyes to certain things that then he later you know spent the next decades writing about but um I think it's it, what, what it was actually reading um, a year in the life of 1599 that first sort of made me think. Well, this is again what what did he do during those years before before he arrived on the stage in London? What was he doing during those eight years? Where was he? And there's lots of lots of ideas that he was a schoolmaster in the country, or he was you know taking care of horses in front of in front of play, uh, theater uh, playhouses and things like that. And it's it's just one of those, th it's, it's the area of fiction writers. You, you have a mystery, let's create some characters in an, in an incredibly rich time, which, and, and then always going back to the language too, and, and an amazing um, constant uh, uh, dance with that. So anyway. That's Andrew Traitman, who's writing a novel about Shakespeare. Great. Here's a lady who wants to. Please come up to the microphone, because people want to be able to hear you. Or we'll so, listen. first, I have a tiny, tiny comment about I actually agree What's with you. Lila. Lila Zomzagne. And I, uh, and, you know, coming from the point of view of French theory, I was educated in France, uh, there's a very strict radical separation. For instance, Proust, who wrote uh, Contre Sainte-Beuve, Against Sainte-Beuve, wrote this book saying that the biographical eye lends absolutely nothing to the work. And then he writes In Search of Lost Time. And of course, the narrator is called Marcel. And then for 50 years, French academics are trying to scold students saying Marcel is a narrator and then uh, the author is somebody else. And of course, it's interesting to see that 
the writer can be also extremely disingenuous, and yet it's so important to make the difference. And at the end of the day, I think I'd be more interested in saying that the, the work uh, is far more interesting than whoever wrote it and why. And also we talk about Nabokov at length. I think it's a, it, it's a very important question for writers like Nabokov, which so many suppositions have been made, and they're completely irrelevant. Who cares what kind of sexuality Nabokov had, really? What All that matters is the texture and the, and the color of the work. And I have my question when you talked about transparency is that I'm very curious to know exactly what what you meant. Um, is it from a from just auditory point of view or metaphysical? If you would just say something um, about. Well, usually it ends up be having an emotional result uh, that 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 the actor is sort of propelled into some emotion. Uh, but I think it's more uh, sensing some deep truth that uh, is hidden underneath the language. I can't, I really can't uh, give you an example, uh, but I know that it happens quite a lot. Uh, in, in, in other writers, well, I found something similar in uh, Tolstoy, that, but he names it. Tolstoy names it. He follows in, into a thought, into a feeling, until something amazing happens, and you realize, that's true. Oh, God, yes, that, that is life. That's really the way it is. Well, in a play, it's... Uh, it's sort of buried, in, in Shakespeare anyway, it's buried within the text, but uh, I think if you, if you sort of surrender yourself to the text as an actor now, if you just surrender yourself and you go where the text leads you, that uh, it's bubbling under the surface. This kind of truth is bub and humanity and something so real about about life, about about all of us, about the way we behave every day with other people, uh, and uh, so that the the artifice, the artificiality of the situation, of the language. Of, of the costumes, of, of everything. It's all artificial. Suddenly, it becomes real. It's I mean, it th the, the truth shines right through all of that. It's like a mask that reveals everything. I, I uh, you know, I don't know how else to explain it. How would you compare that with subtext? You gotta come up yeah, so with subtext. subtext? That is subtext. Uh, it doesn't sound like subtext. Not exactly. Subtext is really uh, it's much closer to the surface. Than it's more rational, uh, and it's um, it's more motivational. It's uh, it, it's what what provokes the text, and this is deeper than that. So I'm, I'm uh, my name is Pamela. Uh, rather than, than looking at who he necessarily is in his plays, I wonder something else, which is um, we know that to the extent that we understand ourselves, we can understand others. And the extent that we can understand others we then can understand ourselves. And that he was, of course, we all know, a brilliant genius in understanding human nature. And in that time, there were playwrights who were actually trying to help us understand, become aware of ourselves. And if uh, perhaps, my, I wonder if he was more trying to help us understand ourselves using himself and his incredible awareness of all of his feelings and all of his <laughs> observations 
And since he was so in touch with himself, he might better be able to be really in touch with others. And he was one of the rare people that could articulate that and help us really understand ourselves and our unconscious. Oh, I, I, yeah. I mean, he obviously had to be very deeply in touch with himself. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, he might have just been a vessel, yeah. a vessel for these yeah. people. Can I, can I just say something in response to that? Because I, I know we're in hallowed halls of psychoanalysis. Is that uh, in Shakespeare's day, the, 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 the major thinking about what determined your physical and mental health and characteristics, there were two things. There, were, there was the astrological and the physiological. So it was either determined by the position of the stars and the planets, or by the combination of humors in your body. You know, these fluids, you know, melancholy, phlegm, collar, blood that, that course through your body. And we, you know, the, the question of identity didn't exist. I mean, you were your behavior, and your behavior was determined by the stars and by what was going on in your body. And his point of view is clearly so much deeper than that. I mean, he goes so, you know, I mean, we have Richard III explaining himself to the audience and various characters explaining, and, and you kind of go, oh, it's because your mother rejected you when you were born prematurely and didn't, you know, or it's because, um, you know, your mother remarried too fast. Or, I mean, he starts looking at, you know, at these things that shape us in a way that I, I, don't, I don't know that anybody had before. So I think it's a, it's a profound awareness, not just of his own identity and what made him tick, but of, of what makes people tick that was just so beyond the commonplace of his day. So. But then the question is, how did he know it? How did he know yeah. at whatever age he was, what happens to an old man who has lost right. his daughter mm -hmm. and is, you know, so, how do you know it? I don't know. I mean, it's... But he knew it. Remarkable yeah. awareness. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Gail. I was so struck also what you're talking about, the rhythms. And when you, were, when you were talking about the meanings that come up from this transparency, you were talking about the iambic pentameter. And I notice in British productions that come here, they speak much faster, and it's rhythm. It's like it's galloping along. And somehow the meaning is much clearer when I hear those productions. And the metaphors come out, and the words come out, because it is that even surface, so I, anyway, I don't know if They're born to it, we are yeah. not. Ron has written about this in his book. Um, it really stemmed from Peter Hall, and huh. uh, in our country, Barry Adelson picked it up. Yeah. Barry's written a book called, that's the book called Thinking Shakespeare. In Ryland, he, does Ryland, I can't remember his first name. Mark Ryland. Ryland. Yeah, Mark Ryland. Yes. Ryland. Yeah. Anyway. But the notion but that the the verse itself will uh, tell you what the how to play it does, it. and it yes. does. It's somehow much clearer when it's. Well, in, in Romeo and Juliet, he talks about the two hours traffic of our stage, not the three and a half hours traffic of our stage. Yeah. You know, so our productions now tend to be uncut. You know, at least three hours long, and we know that in the day they were they were much faster. And the and the rhythms are not there very much in the American productions that I've seen. Anyway. Well, they, they are something really, else. They, they're there. born to the manner. <laughs> yeah. We are not. They well, hear it from the cradle. Don't underestimate the American actor. Though. No, no, no. But the American not. actor <laughs> brings. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> And I, I will also throw in the controversial topic that we could spend hours on, which is that our accent and dialect is actually much closer to Elizabethan yes. mm -hmm. than current English received pronunciation. The Ozark accent. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Rona. Hi. Um, well, just along the, the rhythm thing, I can't help toss out that along the lines of what you said, um, something that Alvin would really, I think, this would resonate for you more, is that um, a group of psychologists actually analyzed, psychiatrists, psychologists analyzed King Lear's meter and found that as he got progressively madder and madder, um, the cadences, the, the variations that Shakespeare chose to write into the, um, and to do with the um, iambic pentameter actually started to mimic the actual cadences of people who suffer from schizophrenia. 
I mean, really directly. It's like a generic correlation. They were just, they were just stunned. Um, he somehow knew that too. So again, it comes back to the question of like, how how did he know all these things? It's pretty astonishing. Um, and what I'm struck by here is that. You're not really concerning yourselves when you try to understand the man. You're not concerning yourself with whether he did this until age 18 and then he did that. You're not, you're not talking about like Shakespeare of Stratford on Avon versus Shakespeare who might have been Edward de Vere or Queen Elizabeth, like whatever. Um, you're actually trying to understand the man, whoever that man was. Um, and what's interesting is you keep coming back to what you see in the through lines in the work or in moments in the work. And so really, you keep coming back to the language. So really, in, you're, you're wanting to understand the man to understand the works more deeply. But really, you keep coming back to the works in your effort to understand the man more deeply to understand the works more deeply. And I, I just think that there's something um, very profound about his writing that that says. I'm not sure what that is, but <laughs> um, but it just it just strikes me as as an interesting point. It always comes back to the language. And one other thing about that is that I think what's interesting is that while he was of his times in so many ways, and you see that in in this aspect or that aspect, and you see certain through lines like the whole pop and jay kind of thing that carries through. You also, in many ways, keep seeing him grapple with these very same things, and you see him grapple in it by instead of just writing some stock character who's evil. He does give you the motivations for why that person was wronged and is hence evil. Um, or, you know, you find it like you, you hear him say things that are blatantly racist, but then he has Aaron give this incredible speech about what has, how he's been wronged by virtue of the color of his skin and why that has made him who he is. And so he just keeps even subverting that in a way that's questioning. And I think that that's very, that gives us a lot of insight into who this person was whoever he was, who I think was stretched for anything, but that's, that doesn't matter. So, who do you think it was? Well, I, I like to, I, I, I just choose because you can't connect, you can connect the dots like this, or you can connect the dots like that, however you so want you to connect the name, few. Stratford of a uh, Shakespeare of Stratford on Avon. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I like to think that it was him because, again, I like to think any. I, I like to be democratic and think anybody could be a genius. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't really think it matters. It's interesting to me. Um, in in writing the book, one of the things I came across was uh, Ted Hughes' uh, introduction to a, a collection of uh, best excerpts from Shakespeare, in which he goes into a long, long introductory digression about Shakespeare's contact with the uh, mystical memory system of Giordano Bruno. Um, and uh, I think that's something that distinguishes Shakespeare in a way, is that every once in a while, when Bob said dreams, dreams are more than our dreams. They're, you know, it's some other realm that he seems to be in, in touch with. I'd be interested if other people felt that way. Hi, I'm Steve. Um, we've approached it, I think, several times um, and then veered away from it. And, th and that is that, that there's the third factor. There's the Shakespeare, <laughs> whoever he might be, and the work. Um, uh, but of course, there's us. Um, and so I think the result of how the panel was structured to a certain extent has brought out the plurality, that the answer to this is a plurality depending on who it is that's uh, approaching this question. And I think for the two of you, the exceptionalist or the alien seems to be uh, the Shakespeare in terms of the work that, that in search of your question. Um, so for some of us, and uh, people have said this in different ways, we're, we're, we're reaching up. Shakespeare brings us something to extend ourselves. Um, and then there was a reference to the gay community and the interpretation of who Shakespeare was in reference to the works. Uh, so that politically functions for them who that Shakespeare is. Um, I suspect for you, your productions want to have a historical accuracy, the best I can get, that that's your Shakespeare to, to somehow call out a combination of whoever he might have been, the work itself, and the, and the time to give it an authenticity. 
Um, I'm not sure for everybody else on the panel, though, who your Shakespeare is. But I, I, that seems to me what, the, what this is about. And that's great, you know, because <laughs> that's why he's timely uh, for those of us who have enough self or something <laughs> to want to use the world around us, in this case, Shakespeare's works, to know more or to know less. Uh, you know, if we want to reduce, we have a need to reduce, or we have a need uh, to discover or explore. It's not exactly a question, and yet I'm asking if anybody hasn't yet told us who your Shakespeare is <laughs> from the work. I'd like to, I'm not, not as clear from you uh, or from you yet about who your Shakespeare is. Um, I think there's also several other things. We haven't really looked at the religion of the times and the politics and the fact that the, the Catholics were being oppressed and brutalized and, and also um, that young men of that time, they were very ambitious at court and people like Philip Sidney you know, were not only uh, very, um, very attentive to the queen and, and sent to different countries or on commissions but also wrote a lot. And uh, it, it seems to me that what we can say about him is that he was an amazingly driven person. That he was someone that in a short amount of time was incredibly productive. You know, the, the few quotes they have about him, one says that he never went out and went drinking with his with the actors afterwards, but went home. Um, and he went home, obviously, to write. I mean, there, there's just so much one can do in in a short amount of time. That, um, and I think that that's that his drive and his ambition is what we can look at in a really interesting way. I mean, I don't, I don't know what you have to say about that, but that if if men at that time and young men and what they wanted to do and what they wanted to accomplish. He bought his own coat of arms. What does that say? He wanted to get to another level. He wanted to not be the Glover's son anymore, but wanted to be someone of a higher echelon in, in the class system. So. Gent. It's so interesting that that kind of petty social climbing exists side by side with this uh, you know, magnificent uh, spiritual metaphysical uh, wizardry um, which you would think would uh, transcend whether you had a coat of arms or not but uh, makes it more interesting the fact that he, he cared about that. Right. One issue that is not discussed enough it seems to me in relationship to this period and to Shakespeare is the powerful anti-court uh, animus that um, uh, begins to run through the, the drama Marston particularly, but all of the all of the dramas um, after 1599, after the after the bishop's edict bans satire, and the satirists then go into the theater, uh, bringing their particular prejudices. One of which was a hatred of the court and everything associated with the court. Um, and um, Shakespeare never ever actually wrote an Italianate court play, unless it's the murder of Gazzago in Hamlet. But Hamlet itself is an is a Italianate court play. Uh, and the assumption is that these courts are driven by dissimulation, by Machiavellism, by adultery, by intrigue, by poisonings. All of these things, of course, are in Hamlet. But they're also in every other playwright of the time, in Webster, in Middleton, in Turner. Uh, and uh, this ultimately, I think, um, issues in 1642 and the and the Puritan Revolution and the end of the court for 18 years. The end of the theater, too, for 18 years. Uh, and uh, I find these uh, this very pervasive in Shakespeare in spite of his aspirations towards being a gentleman. Could I just, uh, whatever he disappeared to. Uh, oh, there you go. Perhaps to put it into context, I used to ask my students at the beginning of a Shakespeare course to place themselves into Shakespeare's day and to, to imagine what they themselves would be doing at their age. And they would come up with, uh, you know, costume drama ideas. And they were somewhat shocked, of course, when I would tell them, well, most of you will be dead, <laughs> either in infancy or from plague or from whatever. And you certainly, 99% uh, of you, would not be following any of those wild aspirations. You would be plying fields, or you would be 
all kinds of manual laborers, which translates into Shakespeare, to go back to what I possibly harped on too much, is that once he somehow got himself to the theater and in the theater, he was faced with a very practical job of getting on and doing. Uh, and I think, again, to repeat myself, when you look at the types of plays he wrote and where he got his material from, that to me speaks of a very practical man who was also acting, uh, who was also uh, a business agent, part of it, uh, of, the, of the company and so on and so forth. Um, so, and, and the, the coat of arms business was actually more to do with, with his father than uh, himself. We, as far as I recall, we don't have any particular reaction uh, about that. Uh, but I'm sure, you know, when he went to court that, uh, you know, he touched his forelock if uh, HM came along and said some kind words after a court performance, if indeed she would even bother with the riffraff. Mm -hmm. Remember, they were rogues and vagabonds. They were constantly banned. Uh, books were banned. Books were burned. So it was, it was a practical job. Yeah. And he, he was exceptionally good at it, thank goodness. Yeah. But he was a practical guy. Well, just guy. to agree with you, I mean, one of his big successes was Titus Andronicus, yes. which was a great grand guignol pot boiler without yes. great psychological depth or philosophy, just lots of arms and heads being lopped off and That's rapes. That's what folks and, wanted. You know, yeah. And he, that, was, that was his like, biggest hit of his early yeah. years. Yeah. 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 It was needed You've been waiting at season. My name is Henry. Uh, when you were talking about the contemporary view of the humors, uh, the thing that occurred to me was that, that Shakespeare was an extraordinary observer and describer of what he observed. When the word came that anthrax was a loose in this community, uh, I realized that I hadn't seen a case of anthrax ever. And I called a couple of people who I thought might know something about it, and they didn't know much about it. So I took Osler down. And Osler had an extraordinary description of all the cases of anthrax that he'd seen uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, or even somewhat earlier. Uh, he didn't know anything about the molecular biology. Uh, Shakespeare describes things that with a kind of vividness of which the underlying mechanism certainly wasn't known then, right. probably isn't known now, and some of it will probably never be known. I think we have time for one more question. One more question. Who would like to speak? The one that's getting up right now. So. Um, I one of the ways, sorry, I'm Elizabeth, um, not, not an expert, mainly a sort of an audience member, but one of the ways it seems to me in which biography butts up against his work is in all the arguably unearned forgiveness that occurs in the late plays, um, to such an extent that it almost seems to do violence to the plays. It's like sort of a Hollywood ending or, you know, a Picardy third, and I, I can't but help wonder what the hell happened to him. I mean, I, you know, that's sort of more <laughs> idle speculation, perhaps, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that um, from a more biographical stance, perhaps, but also from a directorial stance. Like, how do you make that work? Um, forgiveness, when, you know, like Measure for Measure and All's Well, it just yeah. doesn't really seem to be earned and no one really seems happy about it, you know? Yeah. I agree. It's, it's, it's hard. I mean, Winter's Tale, you know, I mean, Hermione comes back after 16 years and, you know, forgives him and he caused the death of their child and put another child out to, you know, to abandon. I she mean, does, it's terrible. She doesn't forgive him. She doesn't say anything. When she comes back from the statue, she doesn't say well, anything. Well, she, she, okay, well, this is one of the, yes, yeah, the question, does she, doesn't, but the play shows redemptive forgiveness, yes, and yeah. she comes back to life, and she Paulina. blesses her daughter, Paulina forgives him, which is after scolding him for 16 yeah, years, yeah. which I'm sure she has a lot of fun doing. Um, you're right, at the end of Measure for Measure, you know, yeah. 
there I mean there there are these incredible acts of forgiveness and you I think you just you find ways you know to justify them on a human level just you know it's the it's the relationships and it and forgiveness always has a measure of grace to it you know so whether we live in a in a whatever kind of universe we live in and whoever you know sets it in motion I mean there is a grace that comes from being able to to forgive. So, you know, working with a cast of actors in any of these plays, you just you look at what the motivations of these people are and, and what they what they want. What do they want? What are their objectives? What are their obstacles? What are the actions that they take to to you know achieve their goals? What's great in Shakespeare is that the information is actually in the text. You really don't have to spend a whole lot of time inventing backstories. You just have to really mine the language. Um, and then sometimes with the women, mine the silences. Isabella says nothing at the end of Measure for Measure, mm -hmm. you know. Um, <coughs> right. uh, is is the uh, the theme of forgiveness more prevalent at the end of his life, in the in the last plays? What do you think, Bob? I think it becomes the predominant uh, mood of the last plays. I think uh, there are no more beautiful words in the language than uh, "no cause, no cause" mm -hmm. from Lear mm -hmm. and uh, from Cordelia. Uh, well, from Ke I mean, the play. In, in there, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, but it is, it's sort of an interesting biographic. I, it's, I find myself surprised that, uh, uh, at finding myself interested in the biographical uh, <laughs> uh, source of this excessive forgiveness. A, a murder he got away with? I don't know. But, uh, but, it, but it, uh, I mean, I think you're right. There is some, uh, you know, Overabundant. I mean, well, I call the last section of my book the the pleasures of forgiveness, and um, there is something about uh, he's exploring forgiveness in some really interesting way. That um, and, I mean, and one of the things that we think we know about him is that he left his wife and he left his kids yes. for many, many years, and maybe he felt really bad about that at some point. More than that, he was an 18-year-old who slept with a girl eight years older than him, 26 years old got her with child, was forced to marry her, left her, abandoned her, went to London. We don't know how often he went back to visit his children or Anne. We do know he left her his second best bed, whatever that means. It doesn't sound very promising um, or very loving. Uh, and who had fallings out with his, with his, uh, with his two daughters um, from time to time. So there was, uh, there was a lot, you know, to want to forgive, I would think, uh, after you know, after such knowledge, what forgiveness? Uh, the life is very rocky. I think that as he got older and began to feel the end coming on, he felt the need for forgiveness. He felt that he needed to mm. practice forgiveness, <laughs> and I think that was a result of mm. uh, just. Getting old. <laughs> On the other hand, he began became a money lender. He became a rack renter. Yeah, they gave him more reason to want forgiveness. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you. about our programs and a complete archive of past Philip Katie's events is available at Philip